SMSF Mates Daily Podcast. This is our general advice warning that we are required to warn you that any advice has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situations or needs and because of that you should, before acting on the advice, consider the appropriateness of the advice having regard to your own objectives, financial services and needs and where the advice relates to the acquisition or possible acquisition of a financial product, you should obtain a product disclosure statement, PDS, relating to the product and consider the PDS before making any decision about whether to acquire the product. Now let's get into it. Welcome back to SMSF Mate, back by popular demand. We're talking about how much do you need in retirement? And how many millions I might need to reconsider. Yeah, look, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a good time to have this uh, part two, um, given the market has, has probably corrected since we last... Uh, chatted about it so correct it's such an official word well that's the only way to sleep at night Gareth uh, <laughs> is it's a correction um and whether it's a permanent correction or not we'll find out um but I think it does make people stop and think when things go bad I think um or go down we've been you know seeing things just go well I've been seeing things just go up 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 when you see it come back down it's it's a time to pause and reflect but then also come back to how you made the decision that original place right so if you sat down and and all the things were you know this is five ten seven years away then you stop and absorb it right and um, if it isn't and it's not stopping if you're in retirement and now suddenly it's, it's created a different problem well, it's probably a good time to sit down with an advisor um, and, and make a plan around it and see if you should correct or stay the course um, but yeah I think um, and re- revisit the spreadsheet that doesn't have any negative months in it uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if that helps you, um, that definitely does. Um, and I think for for me personally, I've got some investments in some unlisted um, investments. So it'll be a couple of months, I would assume, before I get the realised value of how much they've corrected, um, if if anything. Um, and then then I can sit down and, and go through from there. Like that's the that's where the spreadsheet and the financials will then stop and we'll, as trustees, we'll sit down and actually have a look at it and go, okay, are we still okay with all of this? And make a make a decision if we need a correct path. Um, but also, it's also a time to look for opportunities, right? So um, it could be a time to put more in. Depending on your circumstances and where you are, it, it will be something we would look at too. Because, you know, it still doesn't deviate for me personally, making sure I try and maximise the tax contribution by putting more money into super. Um so then I'm still faced with the with the um, quandary of as trustees, what do we do with this cash? Yeah, do we? Because you don't have to invest it; no. you can just leave it as cash. We right? might go. We'll, we'll wait. We'll leave it in cash, and we'll wait to buy back in at a certain point because we don't think this is the bottom. Or no, no, we think this is the bottom. Let's go back in and buy certain asset classes for the next five, ten year period. So I think everyone's going to make those calls individually, but. It's a good time to stock and do that because you know everyone's yeah. everyone's been told concepts of you know you buy back in at different points in the market. Well, this is this is when you can sit down and do that. So um, you, you sit down and have that discussion as trustees or members of the fund and make a plan around it because different people might be at different stages as well. Ashwin, do you have a, a personal approach in terms of how you um, invest in down markets, or uh, only because you you talked about um, knowing when the bottom was? <laughs> yeah, uh, look. Uh, it's probably not a formal strategy as such, um, but it's it, it would be. I've got a, I've got a spreadsheet because I'm an accountant. Um, of course uh, you do. <laughs> and once I got those updated values of those other investments, I can see holistically how much things I've got in what I what I view as liquid, illiquid, um, and the types of investments are they um, Australian shares? Are they global? Are they um, special technology stuff? Are they different markets? All those sort of things. Then then I've got a little table. And then I go, well, where do I see waiting? Um, but and this is where I say, um, um, it's not formal. All of a sudden, you might be presented with an investment opportunity or something completely different. But if that investment opportunity in this, um, in this venture stacks up financially, or um, you can see an upside, well, it changes because you can see a better upside than following the norm. So everyone's got the opportunities in front of them, and there's tons of things to invest in um and it's just being pragmatic enough to go well what what could we do and as long as you're not giving up um on on the short-term things if you're in pension phase ultimately it's a long-term game super right so you've got to try and go okay yeah i might be a bit down now that the the spreadsheet's not looking great but 
I can go back. You can in. fiddle some numbers in a spreadsheet. You can, uh, you, you can change the colours. Yeah, it, it makes you feel better. You change the colours, make you feel better. Yeah, but again, it's not going to. It needs to still be cash at the end when, <laughs> yeah, when, yeah. when, uh, when I retire. Um, yeah, there's a there's a reality to it, right? Um, and, and I think that's where it stacks up. So you, you um, I've, I've maybe I've said it previously, and I, I, I'm at a phase where I'm, I'm sub forty. I might not look it on camera, but I'm <laughs> sub forty, and. Um, the opportunities to take a higher level of risk at this point in my time is is now um, because I've got another twenty five to thirty years of working um, that I can recoup any losses that happen. So my risk profile now is probably different than what it would be. Well, it would be different to what I would be in 10, 15 years from now. So everyone's got to weigh their own personal situation, how they how they feel about things. And if you're a part of a super fund with other people, other people need to also say what they're comfortable with as well. So ultimately, everyone you know, sit down and make that plan. But um, it also will come back to, you know, how much do you need in retirement? So if you've had some big wins, maybe cashing it out now and reinvesting in a different strategy might make sense. But you need to sit down as a group to see if that's actually, you know, you've had a big win in the last two years to do that. And do you, reflecting back on how much you need in retirement, do you base your investment strategy at this point in time on that? Or is it about as getting as much as you think you can in a risk adjusted way uh when i'm sitting down with with the members in the fund it is it comes back to what i think retirement spending will be and when it's um opportunities in that time and moment i'm looking at the opportunity and then then i frame it around that so yeah still still when there's other people involved and my, my fund does involve other people we sit down and make a plan around that but yes um because we we in my case, I do want to make sure there's enough retirement income because ultimately that's what the fund's for, right? It's the vehicle for retirement. Um, but you do have chances when you can see things in front of you and go, hey, I might put money in there. You know, you know there's there's different risk mentalities out there for people. How about yourself, Gareth? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the question's coming back to um, is there any update on how much you think you need for retirement or has your yeah, strategy okay. changed in current and recent markets? Yeah, so um, I'm 35. I've been used to double income, no kids, you know, with nice wine collections and whatnot, um, <laughs> uh, spending habits. Um, and we now have a kid, so we're no longer double income, no kids. We're I don't know what the acronym is for... One income, one well, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think... For us, we we don't want to sacrifice the time that we are alive to have a whole bucket of money in super that we can't spend. Unfortunately, we've got quite a lot of um, you know pe- uh, friends of parents or you know parents of our friends who haven't made it past sixty five or seventy, and you know one guy in particular um, was a you know two weeks away from retiring at sixty two. Never been on holiday, you know. He's got two million bucks in super, and then got brain cancer. You, uh, you, know? you don't want to be the wealthiest man in the cemetery, is that? No, reason? exactly <laughs> right. And so, you know, I think the real the realism is, you know, we want to do things while we while we can without without getting to the point where we hit sixty five and then we don't have any money to do anything. You know, that that's that's you know. So it's a pretty interesting way. Um, I completely mirror Ashwin's comment about get the maximum tax effective. Um, you know, thing that you can do. You know, both Kirsty and I put as you know twenty five thousand to the cent almost every year into our super fund because we can, and you know we don't have to sacrifice anything to do that. So you know we're able to build our balance up quicker, even if it means not taking any risks in our super fund. Um, we 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 have been in the position that we can put cash in now, so it, the reliance on the fund going up so much isn't as important as our ability to put money into it. Um, and then from an investment point of view, um, I've always loved the, you know, for some reason I read a long time ago about the rule of thirds and it was like 33, 33, 33. And it was, you know, put a third in high risk, put a third in no risk. And then the third in the middle, sort of nice little safe, (laughs) safe chips. And I've kind of followed that thirds concept. It's a bit like the 80, 20 rule. The 80, 20 rule seems to apply to everything. Um, the thirds concept for me seems to apply to everything in business as well. So, um, <clears throat> we kind of follow that. Uh, we've got you know some safe ch- safe bets, some medium safe, and you know some some punts, <laughs> if you want to call them punts. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. And I think the other big thing is um, being a, in a position to have paid off your house. So you know, if you throw a mortgage in when you're in retirement, 
then that takes a pretty big slice out of your, in, your you know, you need an income to pay for a mortgage. So the options are live cheaper, move, or get it paid off quicker. So there's a lot of kind of... See, I, I think that's where I might differ from you. Like I, I, I look at home loan debt, and as much as it scares me, the amount of the debt is, the interest rate is... Still low, even with the recent it's rising. You know, yeah, what's we, what's the date of this podcast? No, 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 <laughs> it, it's gone up. What uh, to yeah, fair, but, uh, fair increase from the RBA to date, and maybe more to come. But I'll, I, I still look at it going when I've got, let's say, an extra twenty grand in the offset account, and we've we've bought our dream house. So all accounts is that we're not upgrading anything else. Is that but, your wife's words or your words? Uh, that, that's uh, that's actually her words. Oh, um, so yeah, all good there. Um, Get that in, in writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, it, it then comes back to you got money in your offset account, and if we got enough money in our offset account for a rainy day, um, then we're going. All we're really doing is saving maybe you know three and a half four percent interest or whatever it ends up being each year, versus. If you go into my super fund and save me, mm. you know, a percentage off my tax and then invest for my retirement. Because in my head, the house will be paid off in 30 years yeah. naturally. So we don't need to go overs and go above because what I'm really going to miss out is the opportunity for that money in my super fund to grow in a lower tax environment and prepare me for retirement. Right. You are right. You, you do sacrifice not having access to the money. So maybe, you know, dream holidays and all the rest of those things can't happen because we've put money into retirement. But if something did happen to me and passed away, the money's going to go to my wife and it will fund a retirement. It's not, it's not disappearing into no man's land. Um, it just means I didn't get to enjoy it. But mm. I'm still making sure I try and do things I enjoy throughout You're my not life. Missing out on much, no, no, no. Well, <laughs> when you've got two kids, uh, five and three, uh, there isn't a lot of fun things <laughs> you left, can, to you, do. You, <laughs> left to do. Your weekends are spent around sporting <laughs> fields and and tantrums and, and Tantrum. snacks and sleep times and everything else. So sorry to interrupt, but on the um, you should be Tim, you should be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the topping up your super contributions. Yep, because that one really resonated with me last time um, we, we did this. So let, like, if you if you talk it out, say yeah. if you're on a hundred grand salary. Your super, well, it's it's ten percent, right? Oh, it's I think it's ten and a half um, as of one July this year. Okay. Um, but yeah, you're right. So let's say your hundred grand salary, ten and ten thousand five hundred is going to super. You're allowed to put up to twenty seven five hundred, but that's obviously got to come from your own personal fund. So most people are paying off their mortgage. Now, if you're really tight and you don't have a safety net, I would not be. You know, it doesn't make real sense to put money into super as much as it's tax tax great, but. You need to have a safety net for your personal life. So make sure all of those things are done first, but you can put money in a super. Um, and if you don't use it one year, you can catch it up as long as your balance is low and, um, you know, you, you're at that point. So I think yeah. most people um, are maybe not aware of the salary sacrifice in a super, and that's mm -hmm. something they should explore, but that also means it's salary sacrifice. So it's coming out of your pay. So make sure you've still got enough yeah. in your lifestyle. But but if you're so if you're in a position to do it to top up to that full amount, on that additional amount that you're putting in, there's obviously a tax benefit. So yep. and and you could look at that tax benefit as kind of like an investment return. Yeah, right? yeah. well, so it's, it's, it's money. It's, it's, yeah. it, it is right. So that's the easiest way. I, I sort of explain to most people. Let's say your tax rate's thirty nine percent, a tax in super's fifteen. You just got that. 20, yeah, that, that difference. You got the difference back as a return, which is and the same as like three years of the. Uh, that's a bloody good, going up. bloody good return. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> so you're leaving that on the table every year. Now, because the HO change rules, it says you can catch that up in future years. You haven't really given it up as long as you can still meet those requirements. Right. But um, you're mindful that it, 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 it should be used. Um, and some people will let it, let it lapse and not use it. And then when it gets to retirement, um, and I don't know Garrett's personal situation, but you might have a great time through your life. And then when you get to <laughs> and uh, you might get to your 50s and then you start thinking, oh, yeah, retirement's around the corner, and then you realise, I don't have enough in super. And yeah. now, you, now you're now trying to catch up with this little window of time versus if you had that conversation at 40 or 36, bang, you've got you got more time to actually make the adjustment to your personal life to, to have that ideal retirement. Um, and that's the way I've pragmatically looked at it for me um, and, and my wife. Um, we, we sit down and talk about that side of it. But the biggest thing for us was um, was getting the house. Um, and, 
and all yeah. the things that come with that. So it's your longer term strategy that you might make every dollar into superannuation as efficient as possible oh. and have potentially an earning rate that exceeds your cost of debt for your home. Oh, and then do a yeah. lump sum repayment at the back end is that, that 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 that's a valid strategy. You could do that. Um, you know, at retirement. Sorry, I wasn't suggesting no, that. No, I was no, no, wondering if is that what you're planning to do? No, the the plan is because because of my age, it will be paid off at retirement age anyway. Right. So there's no need for us to change. So we bought what we, I would hope, is our forever <laughs> home, and we're not changing it. This will be the last home loan we have. So. As long as we manage to pay that off, we're we're okay, um, and that's that's fundamentally the, the decision we have. When people decide to upgrade their houses at you know fifty or forty five, and they take on more debt, well then that home loan's over twenty five years. That's into your retirement, then you probably need to draw your super out. So you'd hope your super funds outperforming that that debt. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense financially to do what you're doing. Um, but me and my wife also talk. We we don't have dreams of buying a holiday home. We don't want to do any of those sort of things. So we're not trying to save up for those things. Yeah. Happy to pay for the ridiculous Airbnb rates to go down and spend time, but that's okay. That mm. That's a cheaper cost than holding on to a holiday home in, in the southwest. Yeah, I, I, my, <laughs> I've done the spreadsheet on that as well. And <laughs> it don't make sense in my head either. What, you know, Look, If someone sets up a hotel <laughs> that I can buy uh, and I'll get a room – during the peak season of school holidays and I'll get a rental return that adds up, then maybe investment-wise it stacks up. But like you, yeah, the spreadsheet. Don't work. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, you start throwing all the fees and then it really stuck in my head that someone said they owned a house down there and then every time that they went down there on holiday, they were just doing maintenance yeah. and gardening. To, to look, you know, Whereas the, the wonderful thing about going in – um, staying in someone else's house is you really don't give a shit. You can just throw, it, you know, like like it sounds horrible. No, um, someone's going to clean you it, know, and and I am someone who does look after things, but I always complain about the wine glasses are rubbish and the the knife. There's only three knives, and I, I understand why people do it because you put hundred dollar Rydell glasses in there, they'll be smashed to smithereens. Yep. All the nice globe knives go in the in the dishwasher. When we, when we ask the serious question, are you bringing your own wine glasses? Yeah. Your <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's nothing. There's nothing worse than when you go to an Airbnb, um, and I went to one recently. Um, it was a two bedroom with a wood fire in Margaret River. Right, that's what that's what you want in winter. Right, no wood. Right, so there's a log fire in the thing. No wood. Message to the owner. Oh, we're not doing that at the moment, and the reason is they don't oh, need you, to. You meant the fireplace. Sorry. The fireplace. Sorry. sorry, yeah, yeah. The fire. No, no. But well, the, the next part's coming. Was the yeah. reason because they didn't have enough in super? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> they were just being stingy, right? And it really pisses me off. Um, and so, if I was the owner of that one, I've now just got a message from you know on a Saturday morning from a grumpy, t- grumpy, but you know, th- there's all that. The tenant t- with no wood. Yeah, the ten- yeah, right, and then. Uh, and then the wine glass thing, you open the cupboard and there's three champagne glasses. So there's there's four of us staying there. I want to have a nice bottle of champagne, three champagne glasses, right? It's 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 the little tiny little things that matter. But if I was on the receiving end and I was the owner, <laughs> you, you on do. Saturday morning when I'm laying in bed, I've now got a text from a pissed off, you know, Airbnb person saying there's no wood and only three <laughs> wine glasses, right? <laughs> I mean, that's not worth the spreadsheet. <laughs> you don't put that in the spreadsheet. I'd take my uh, rocket coffee machine <laughs> down. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pain, but it's... it's <laughs> right. Impressed know. that you've got a rocket. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think t- relating that back to uh, how much do you need in retirement, um, depends if you want a holiday home. Um, you know, no, and, <laughs> you know, do that, you need two houses? And ultimately, that's the thing. Like I think we talked about it the last time we did this um, podcast. It it's, comes back to your spending. Um, ultimately, that's going to dictate if you've got enough for retirement. Some people... And debt, right? Like, oh, Yeah, it, your net position. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely your net position at retirement. You'd hope The one thing you'd hope most um, Australians aim for is to come into retirement with no debt on their house mm. um, or credit cards and you've got assets now funding your retirement yeah. um, and you've got the age pension as a safety net and, and that's what it should be. You know, Some people can survive off the age pension. Good, good on them if they can. Um, I have a feeling it won't be around when... I reach retirement age. So well, where's the money coming from? Uh, our kids working, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we just got to keep producing more babies at work and pay off our retirements. But well, who knows? Um, and that's ultimately why the biggest um, things people need to focus on is how do you fund retirement and, and try not to rely on inheritances that may come in the future. And if you do get luck, fortunate enough to inherit money from your 
um, loved loved ones um, throughout life, then invest in them wisely. Um, so they do invest in the family members or the the fund. <laughs> oh, look, I think uh, invest invest in both parts. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, ultimately you need to be wary that, that those opportunities have come of other people's sacrifices, and to make sure you, you use it wisely for your own self. Mm. Uh, but in, <coughs> in most cases, the um, you know that intergenerational wealth transfer is going to benefit the generation after. Right? Yeah. So your kids, in your case, by the time that by the time that you see your you know um, your time through, you would have had to have worked. You would have had to have had a strategy, put everything in place, not to rely on something to happen th- and if it does it's the I next gen's benefit i think you're assuming Sonny, that people are switched on enough that they're taking active active views in their super at, at our age um or at my age um if they're not some of them are probably going to rely on those inheritances to get them out of the house that they've overextended for or they've lived through you know going on holidays and everything else through their you know lived it up but then they're relying on that inheritance to save them at the end. And then there will be an ultimate benefit to their kids, but it might not be. I, I view that as the biggest issue is um, if, you, if you're if you in the position where it does, it's just a bonus that comes through that will benefit your, your, your kids. That's great because it's going to be enough of a struggle given, you know, what house prices are now for them to get into the market that you need that just to get them through. Um, but if you're someone that relied on that for your own retirement, well then, you got one house to maybe split around three kids to get them into a house. So you've you may have squandered what your your parents were trying to do for the grandkids. And I think the best way for any of these things to happen is you sit down and have conversations as a family and then maybe the message gets through to you at a younger age that, hey, mum and dad mm. want that inheritance for the grandkids to make sure they get a house. You've already got one. You pay that off and make sure you provide for your grandkids because... I think that's that's a valid point from my view anyway. Yeah. Are they teaching um, financial literacy at school yet? Um, I, I actually, oh, I've got a five year old, so I haven't looked at his yeah, curriculum okay. yet. Um, but I, I'm assuming there are basic things maybe taught um, in terms of counting and arithmetic, but I don't know if there's a formal mm. financial literacy course yet for kids. I, I know, um, you know, the Barefoot Investor and people like that have been pushing for mm. something like that to be more formalised, um, whether whether that happens or not, um, we'll, we'll see. Just to loop back for a second, the reason I raised that earlier comment was because when we talk about how much you need in retirement, um, you know, some people don't only just view that as how much will I personally need in retirement yeah. to fund my expenses and my requirements and objectives, but um, is there an amount of money that you have a goal and objective to leave behind as a legacy to mm. help future generations and pay it forward to a degree. So <laughs> I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is encourage people to say, if you are of the, the ilk of wanting to do that, then that needs to be factored into how much do you need yeah. in retirement, right? It's not just your number, but it's a number that you want to um, potentially help kids with. And as you say, Ashwin, into properties and houses. Yep. There's, you know, if, if you take the number that you think you need, based on projected expenditure or, or wants and then all of a sudden you think about wanting to help kids or grandkids or whatever it might be and take that number out of the pot, um, you haven't yeah. left yourself with... Takes a big dent, right? No. and uh, I think that that's where you have a lot of these bigger conversations um, with, you, with your partner and uh, about bigger choices, right? So we've made the active choice and that was, that was the reason for the move of the house. Um, with school zones. So right. you know, for us, if we could afford to, let's move into a school zone for um, our youngest son's got a, um, a, a disability um, and we wanted to find a school zone that um, accommodated that and we did. But I knew personally if I was forking out what it costs to send a kid to a private school, I would inherently put pressure on my kids. And I've I've known of clients of ours anyway where the, the kids have gone through to uni and everything else and they want to do a trade. You know, it was clear as day at year ten that cost you eight hundred k in school fees, and this 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 kid knew what his passion was and couldn't do it because well, didn't he could have done it, um, but he felt obligated to go through, finish year twelve, go to uni, do a degree, and then become a trade. And I would prefer to have that cash that we would spend on a private education to get my kid to not be an apprentice. Um, after his three years, he could start his own business. And well, here's another spreadsheet yeah. test for you. I did the school fee spreadsheet as well, and and mapped out the cost of. This is me nerding out a bit, but 
I did year one to year 12 at yeah. a typical private school in Perth yeah. at a market fund rate. Yeah. And that kid didn't need to work. If you go like what it costs from five year old, you know, 25, 20 grand yeah. a year up to uni, 21, whatever, you put, you put the same number, the same money in the same year in a fund. By the time they get to, I don't know what the number oh, was off the top of my head. No, no, no. By the time they get to 21, they had something like one and a half million dollars. You know, like I'll have to work it out. I'll do, I'll do, I'll go find yeah, my spreadsheet yeah, again. Okay. But, you know, the idea was if you're in a position to be able to pay for school fees, then there is a scenario where they'd actually don't need to work. I'm kind of <laughs> glad I didn't do the spreadsheet because I would have been more anxious about it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you it, know, it, it I don't think it, I mean, if let's just say the numbers are one and a half at the end, if mm. that's the number and if that's enough, um, then I don't think your math's going to be that far off. But that, that's mm. a better, broader philosophical yeah. question around education and the like. No, no, and th- that's a valid point, right? But it's not they didn't go to school. Mm. No, they no. went to the no, private school. school. And, yeah, yeah and, uh, and that's where I, I've got mates that have got kids at private school and uh, we had we had a – because I'm looking at it from a financial point of view because that's how my mind works. He's like, mate, have you seen the, the things my kid does at school? And I went, yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. But if your kid's inclined that way and it excels that person and it has for this particular – our family I'm talking about, um, mm. obviously won't name them, um, but um, you can see you can see the extra work that the, the teachers and the school are putting into this uh, kid at this age and what he can do at the age of eight. But I'm like, I don't know if my kids are going to be like that and I don't want to create the pressure. So I've made that decision. I said, look, I might be doing detriment to the education in the future, but I went to a public school. Um, there was opportunities to do things outside of it, but it was you know my parents and my my brother and people around me saying, hey, you can make it. It's harder, but, you know, there's something to say about that as well personally. Um, but, um, yes, there are some great institutions and um, educators in the private education that give good opportunities for people. But financially it was a big cost that I could see I could reinvest in the kids in another way. Um, and that, yeah, that's ultimately course. what I, I made a decision yeah. on. Um, I think adversity is valuable, right? right? Yeah, yeah. a bit of pain, experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and just to clarify my comments, so I have used the um, very handy calculator that's on SMSF Mate's website, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I, I very quickly, hypothetically, did um, fifteen years of um, two grand a month. So what's that? Twenty five grand a year without any inflation. Is that what it costs? Yeah, it doesn't cost so much. It doesn't cost so much in the early years. I say fifteen. Really. Can, Pe- depending on the school. Oh, well, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you look at the typical, and right, it goes up go. from there. Right, um, it's because they've got a meditation room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we meditate the money that's in the air. Yeah. Right? Well, well, there's another school north of the city that's up at 50. So, um, so monthly, oh. event, so I, I put 8%, right? Um, 960,000 bucks. So you start you start your life at twenty one with a million dollars, you know, like that's an interesting. Oh, hopefully, there's no big dip at the end of it. But yes, uh, look, I think yeah. I think it's valid, um, and oh, that made me more comfortable with the decision I made. Um, <laughs> uh, that we we we'll, we'll do it that way, and we'll see how our kids go. But yes, um, but like if you if you really think the idea of going, you know, the ph- philosophical idea of going to private schools to get a better job. That's the theory, right? For some people, it is. Yeah, so yeah, for look, some look, people, it is. Look, there, there is something to be said. There is definitely a network, and there's there's the benefits of going to a private school. But I, I, I think, it, and it's a bias that I have personally because I went to a public school. Um, that as long as it's a public school that you feel safe in the environment, there are opportunities for kids that show an interest in academic to pursue things. It is harder in certain areas, but um, that that's my personal view on it. But then, if you do go down uh, a trade um, pathway, it's not. I would imagine not as shame. Oh, not actually not the right word, but it wouldn't be as an easy pathway. They might be better place to get someone into a chippy role than you know you go into yeah. one of the elite schools in in the state and you say, "Hey, I want to be a chippy." You know, like, we don't have facilities for no. trades in this, yeah. in this school. We'll teach you how to be a performer. Yeah, you want to be a you know be a finance analyst. You want to be a lawyer. You want to learn how to run a business. We've got stuff for that, but for a trade, we're not built around that well. Yeah, you know, that's the, an interesting point as well. Like the the school is set up for yeah. certain careers. And when I look at all the technology around the world and things that can be replaced, I'm pretty sure my uh, accounting nuance could be replaced by a computer. But I'm pretty sure I'm still going to pay for a tradie to come and change the lights in my house. So, 
um, I think that they might be safe <laughs> from, from an What suburb do you live in again? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for tuning in to SMSF, mate. Hope you enjoyed the, uh, the session. Please subscribe to our um, podcast and check out our website, www.smsfmate.com.au. I know, I don't think we win any awards for uh, a concise uh, business. <laughs> 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 it, 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 it writes well, but it's, it's pretty hard to say in the podcast. Um, thank you for joining us once again. If you're interested in our waffle about self-managed super funds, feel free to join us on smsfmate.com.au or search smsfmate.com in Spotify.